so I'm Russell. I'm in first year and I'm a VP events and recruitment. So I'm really excited today to have Dr. Faran. Uh, he's tuning in from Phoenix, Arizona. And I Googled today, it was 20 degrees Celsius. <laughs> snow here, Dr. Faran. So <laughs> that's all I have to say. Um, so I initially became interested, interested actually in like the dental aspect of business through watching Dr. Fran's podcast and his podcast is called Dentistry Uncensored. He has over 1,500 episodes and there's a variety of, variety of topics including dentistry business and finance, oral health, new technologies. And there's a variety of different people also on his podcast, including dentists and uh, specialists, business administrators, people all over from dental materials and dental corporations. But what I like most about his podcast is that he always keeps the students and the young dentists in mind. And he kind of teases out um, when he asks questions to the people he interviews, he teases out details that will help us. So on top of his podcast, he's also the founder and CEO of Dental Town Magazine. And Dental Town also has a website, which is a, a form with over 120,000 120, dentists, where you can discuss on all topics, including business and oral health. And this website also has CE courses and they're actually free for students if you're interested. So I'm really happy that you're all here today and I'm excited to learn kind of a how to of the business side of dentistry from uh, an absolute expert. And I think that if you ever have any questions in the world of dentistry, I would highly recommend searching up Dr. Friend's uh, podcast with like your question in it and something will come up or you can even search on his website, dentaltown.com for answers. And that's what I've done. And I always get answers with many different points of view. So without further ado, Dr. Friend. Russell, I just want to know where you bought your wig, man. I'm, I'm going to buy one. I'm buying one tomorrow. Did, was it on Amazon? Uh, that is that is too good a hair to be true. Um, please call me Howard. Um, the format, remember, I don't wear a tie because personally, when I see someone wearing a tie, I assume it's to keep the foreskin from going up over his head. Uh, I'm sure they're lying. Uh, politicians are, you know, um, hell, I, I live in a country where we just had our current president just got impeached uh, for the second time. The first time wasn't enough. Uh, they needed to get him again. Um, these are crazy times, but I just want to uh, keep it real for you guys. Um you're lucky as hell. I mean, like, like look, look at these political times. People are saying, oh, my God, this is the worst divisive period they've ever seen. Really? You didn't hear about the Civil War? Uh, that was 100 years ago, and one in 30 people got killed. When I started lecturing around the world, I couldn't believe it when I went to Cambodia because I'm 58. Every dentist who was my age was dead dead inside. I mean, I and I, I couldn't figure it out. Everybody 35 and under was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Everyone 50, 60, 70 was dead inside. Then you go to the Khmer Rouge, um, Khmer Rouge Museum and you find out that, you know, every one of those dentists, um, they wouldn't talk. But I talked to your son. I said, well, what's wrong with your dad? Well, when the Khmer Rouge took over, they killed his mom and his sister. You know, I mean, so, so 5,000 years of history is just filled with horrible stuff, and you can, you know, and if you're mad at the history, you know, feel free after the seminar to go to the closest cemetery you can find and just start yelling at dead people for everything they did wrong, but it's good to be alive, and it's really good to be a dentist in 2021. I mean, it is. It is a good time. Um, heads up, though, um, I, you know, we're, we're, we're past the, um, um, the coronavirus 2020. We're going into 2021, but I do think it's very likely that the economic, uh, the next economic contraction is going to be worse than the pandemic. What I mean by that is I was born in 62. That was the flash crash of the market. So I was even born on a bad year. Graduating high school in 1980, that's when interest rates were 20%. Uh, unemployment um, was 11%, double-digit unemployment inflation. I graduated in 87, May 11, 87, and September 
uh, was Black Thursday. The market crashed a quarter in one day. Uh, then the Y2K bubble. Um, I don't even want to know how old. I, by the looks of your faces, I don't even know if any of you were alive in tw- 2000 when the stock market. A lot of you look like you could still be in grammar school. And I'm like, are these guys really in dental school? Uh, they look like babies. Um, but the bottom line is um, I lived through the Y2K crash and then Lehman's Day. But, you know, Joseph Schumer got a Nobel Prize in economics for business cycles, and everybody kept saying, well, why is there all these cycles? Oh, I don't know, maybe because a bunch of crazy monkeys make all the decisions. Um, I'm really bullish on artificial intelligence because we got 5,000 years of history of natural intelligence, and that was a that was we didn't do too good with five thousand years of natural intelligence. So I'm really hoping the next five thousand years with augmented artificial intelligence. So we're gonna go into a pandemic crash. I know a lot of you guys, a lot of people. I see about eighty percent of the planet um, just believes what they want to believe in. I mean, I grew up in that. My two older sisters are nuns. My mom believes a- a- anything the Pope to says. You know, she would believe it. Uh, so you have the people who are believers, and that's fine because. I mean, my God, our species has been going for 200,000 years, and it's the number one apex uh, creature. It lives on every continent. Hell, you guys make 300,000 babies a day. Somebody's getting laid out there. If you're wondering, like, how come I never get laid? Well, someone's getting laid. 300,000 babies fall out every single day. Our species is unstoppable. You're not going to stop Homo sapien. In fact, don't even call it Homo sapien because you already killed all the other homos, Homo Neanderthal, um, Aristopelica, Homo habilis. We're down to just, we're the last remaining Homo, so we're just a sapien. And, And it's good to be the king. I mean, it's good to be sapien, and it's especially good to be sapien in Canada. United States, Australia, New Zealand, the Western world, you know, it's still, it's still challenging times. Um, if we reduce the 8 billion people down to three, one has a smartphone, one just has a cell phone, one ain't got anything. And I've been in those countries, I've lectured in probably 25 countries where they don't got that anything. You know what? They're actually happier in Kathmandu than they are here. I mean, I remember in, um, I remember, you know, I, I remember seeing a kid in Walmart because his mom wouldn't buy him a shirt that had uh, Larry Fitzgerald on at number 11. And then not very much longer, I was in uh, San Paolo where the kids would just pick up a piece of charcoal and they'd write the number on their skin and they had a bigger smile with the, just the written number on, on a bare chest than, than having a $12 shirt from Walmart. So it's all in your head. And um, so this next challenge, I just wanted to talk about how do you spot bubbles real quick. I mean, the Buffett indicator is something I learned in 1980 just by where I was born. I was born in Wichita, Kansas. I went to Creighton, Omaha, Nebraska. That's where Warren Buffett was. He came over and lectured in 1980 to our Business 101 class. No one even knew who he was. I don't think anybody outside of the class knew who he was. He was. I thought he was the stupidest guy I ever met. That's how dumb I was because I was all into the, the nifty 50 and high tech and Kodak and Xerox. And he's like, well, I asked him, do you, do you own the nifty 50? Well, Howard, um... You need to take a five by seven business card with a number two pencil. And if you can't explain to me what your business does and how it makes profit on a five by seven business card with a number two pencil, I'm not going to buy it. And I thought, okay, you're an idiot. And uh, looking back, I should have dropped out of school, took my tuition money, bought Berkshire Hathaway, and then went and worked at Pizza Hut for 40 years. Now I'd be worth like, I, I figured it out one time. If I would have taken that freshman year $6,000 tuition and bought Berkshire Hathaway, I think I'd have something like $28 million or something like that. But anyway, his index is really simple. 85% of the world in America, Canada, um, they, they all work for themselves, small business, 25 employees or less. And all the people that make all the newspapers that they publicly traded, they're, they're about 15% of the economy. And the bottom line is that uh, 15%, the value of that obviously could not be greater than the value of the whole country's GDP. So if the GDP is a dollar, Well, the total market cap of the stocks within that country got to be less than a dollar. And every time it gets to be about a dollar 10 or a dollar 20, it comes right back down. And whenever it gets down to 80 or 70, it goes right back up. Well, right now, the United States is at 180 percent. It's never been seen before. In fact, for the entire globe, it's 120 percent never seen before. To show you how ridiculous it is, Tesla's market cap today, if you sold it, 
could buy all the other 11 car companies. I mean, companies you never heard of, like uh, Mercedes-Benz, Volvo, GM, Chrysler, Ford, the three in India. I mean, when, 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 and when you drive down the street, I, I haven't seen a Tesla today. But I was in wall-to-wall traffic coming to work today, but it was all Fords and Chevys and things like that. So people just get delusional. And as the percentage of delusional people build up, everyone else starts believing. But you got to uh, – I sold I, – to tell you where I, how smart I am, I sold my million-dollar McMansion because I don't want to be sitting on a house when that uh, 40 50% off uh, goes on sale. Um, back to dental school. Um, the American Dental Education Association says the average dentist graduating dental school um, has $287,000 of student loans. That's propaganda. They know that a quarter of the kids' daddy pays for school, so they're averaging in all those zeros to bring that number down. If you back out all the daddy did it, hell, it's closer to $400,000. Now, if you think that's the end of the world, Old, remember, just having one kid in the United States from birth to seventeen is two hundred and thirty-three thousand. So if you got, so for every two hundred thousand dollars of student loans you have, just have one less kid. My mom and dad had seven. I had four. I told my sons they should all um, only have two, especially the kid three and four. They know more than one and two that I should have never had three and four. Uh, but kids never listen. My oldest one already has four. My four boys have turned into six. So everything's relative. And if you think $287,000 is a, a, a debt is a lot of money, my divorce was $3.8 million. In fact, if you take my, uh, my uh, divorce... Your divorce is going to be over a million dollars, okay? So don't even tell me about When you tell me how much student loan indebtedness you have, you say, well, wh- wh- how much are you budgeting for your first divorce? But I was um, 3800000 divided by $87,000 student loans. My divorce was 43 times more expensive than my student loans, okay? So right now, it's your student loans. And and, and let me talk about student loans a little bit more. First of all, there's 208 countries. You only have access to other people's money in about 20 of those. You know, you can't get student loans. Like, go around the the whole Caribbean to Argentina. They build their houses in increments. First, they buy the land, pay that off, then they lay the floor. And it's a 30-year building process. They don't have access to other people's money to go build a house completely built and then pay it back over 30 years. So, just having access to other people's money that's not related to you and family is uh, is uh, just a, a stroke of luck. Most everything, um, everything you eat, think, and do is a sexually transmitted disease because where your por- parents had sex and where you were born is going to determine your language, your religion, your thoughts. Every, every thought you've had, every thought you ever will have is a sexually transmitted disease. So let me try to correct some of your sexually transmitted uh, cerebral disease diseases. Number one, stay in school. You're already in school. So you already figured out that going to school is better than working at Pizza Hut. Um, You've you've already figured this out. So why do you pull the cord early? Average net income for a dental specialist is $320,000. General practitioner, $197,000. If you're a dentist who owns your own practice, you net 244. You're an employee, you net 147. Why else would you be an employee? Do you think someone's going to hire you for the betterment of society or are they trying to make money off you? Okay. Um, in fact, um, what I love about dentistry and math unlike politics is and religion is that, you know, in, in math, words have meaning. Like geometry, sine, cosine, tangent means the same thing in Kansas, Kathmandu, or if you live in a canoe. But when you say a word like socialism, um, socialism first shows up as owning the means of production. If you go back several centuries, the noble landlords and kings and queens would come by and they'd always steal half your crop and taxes. And you, you tolerated that. But when they took your land and said you got to pay half your crop, you drew your sword and you killed them, okay? So socialism means fighting for your means of production. And I want you to watch during this next crash, and and I'm not a doom and gloomer guy because, hell, I was born on 62 in the flash crash. I've lived through four downs. I mean, don't don't scare me. They they happen all the time. This will be my. I've already gone through five. I didn't remember the first one, but I'm not a doom and gloomer because it don't scare me. I don't get off on it, but. Watch when the doom and gloom, watch what happens when the people who own their own means of production versus the employees. The employees, as soon as sales drop down, they're just going to be thrown out the window. They, they never meant anything to anybody. When they shut down 
dentistry in Arizona for two months. Everybody that owned their means of production, someone calls out, oh, my God, my toothache, it's killing me. I close. I'll tell you what, Margaret, look, um, I'll meet you in my office. But you're going to have your debit card. I'm, I'm not, we're not doing insurance. We're closed. I don't even have an insurance bill. But if I bill you for a medical emergency, $2,500, I'll do the root canal buildup, same day crown. It'll be a three-hour appointment. It'll just be me, you, and the assistant. I, you know how many dentists I had calling me saying, damn, man, I'm doing like one of those every day, and it's nothing but net. Um, I did two on Friday. That was 6000 and I just had an assistant. In fact, I felt so guilty, I tipped her out a couple of Benjamins at the end of the day. I mean, when you own your own means of production, I don't care what happens to the economy. I don't care what happens, but you're in control of job one, and you don't go to school for 12 years uh, to be somebody's bitch. I mean, that that's that's not why you wanted to be a doctor. Now, if now there's only two types of people, those who like to give orders and those who like to take orders. Usually the ones that like to take orders are 18-year-olds, they didn't finish high school, <clears throat> doctors, dentists, lawyers, they're horrible employees. So if working for a DSO is a good idea, well, success always leaves clues. So I want you to go back five years ago in McGill and get the name of all the graduates and get the names of all the ones that went and worked at 123 Dental or whatever DSO there is. And, and sure enough, five years later, they're all still there living happily ever after. Is that what you see? Is that what you see? Or do you see them changing jobs every year, every year? And I don't want to beat up on the DSOs because the majority of the jobs are in private practice. And and you couldn't get two dentists to agree that today is Wednesday. I mean, there's some asshole sitting here out there right now saying, well, in Australia, it's already Thursday. I mean, dentists, lawyers, physicians, they're too damn smart to agree. So look at these dental specialties. You got, there was eight when I got to school, it was 12. Why? Well, in 1900, healthcare was only 1% of the GDP. And by the end of 2000, it was 14%. So first of all, explain that. How does, how does something go from one to 14%? Well, anybody that is a student of history knows that the government is not the solution to your problem. The government always causes the problem. And they always disguise it as, oh, we're just there to help you. So what we did is we started a, a state board of dental examiners in every province and state, and they became the judge, the jury, and the executioner, and they took away all, they closed down all the schools and license, and if you want your school accredited, you gotta go through the government. You want your, your, your anything accredited, go through the government. So what do they do they ran out 90 percent of all the doctors oh and then your wages went up really in supply and demand you mean that if you get rid of 90 percent of all the doctors remaining 10 percent price goes up oh my god what did you read adam smith's book in 1776 200 years of economic theory and it's abusive why why do you need government to help you pay for health care because government already broke healthcare. Like, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, across from the Guadalupe Indian Reservation with 25,000 Yaqai Indian and, and Mexicans from Mexico. There's not one dentist in there because they have no money. Every time a dentist trained in Mexico City or Yuma, Arizona or Chihuahua comes up and opens up a practice, what does the mob do? Oh, to save you, we're going to go kidnap him and arrest him and put him in a cage and deport him because we're just trying to help you. Oh, so you say that no dentistry on the poor is better than this trained doctor from Mexico and all these people are from Mexico and they all speak Spanish and I don't? Yes, that's what we're saying. Well, it's bullshit. You can't afford health care. You know how many doctors are in India? I've been to India. It says a billion, 200 million people there. But if you look at the fine print, it says plus or minus 100 million. Are you out of your freaking mind? Plus or minus, that's plus or minus three Canada's. How many doctors in India would hop a flight in New Delhi today to come to Arizona and work in Guadalupe where there's not one damn dentist there? I mean, you only have, you only have a problem after the government breaks something. And then the young always think, oh, there are our parents, they're there to help us. Okay, well, your family kills 1% of the population in the last 5,000 years. The government kills 6%. What do these people have to do before you realize they're the problem, they're never the solution, and every problem they fix, you haven't read enough history to know that the only reason it was broke because they broke it a century ago. So, so dentistry had no 1% of the economy in 1900. No one had a problem paying for help. 
health care. The boards come in. They, they don't let any competition in. Imagine Canada. If they banned all foreign competition-made cars, what would you get to pick from in Montreal? What cars are made in, Mon- in Canada? You know what I mean? You, you, you couldn't get half. You, and then what would happen to the price? Oh, we'd go up really high. What would happen to the selection? It'd go down. What would happen to the service? Whenever That's why I love DSO. That's why I love 123 Dental. I love anybody that wants to get in the ring with another dentist and punch it out because that's going to make them eat lean, work out means, drink water, uh, breathe air instead of, you know, smoking weed or whatever the hell. Competition is good for every industry, and we're all fighting for the customer who votes for us with his $1 when he gives the dollar to me because I was open on Saturday or Sunday, and he didn't give it to Russell because he was uh, getting his hair done. He closes down his office on Friday because he had a hair appointment on Saturday. So so competition is all good for all everything. Um, but But here we are now. Oral surgeons, um, general specialists make 320, general dentists make 197, dentists who own make 244, dentists who are employees make 144. So hell, you'll make an extra 100 grand just if you work for yourself. Um, oral surgeons are the kingpin and, and, and at $448,000. And then there's dentists I know, half the dentists out there say, well, you know, I, I don't like to extract teeth. Well, what do you like to do? Bleaching, bonding, veneers? Oh, so you're a cosmetologist? Do you do, do Manny Petties? You went to McGill and all you do is Manny Petties, bleaching, bonding, and veneers. I thought they had real doctors there. A real doctor, you come in, my tooth hurts. You got to be able to extract it or do a root canal. That's one of the specialties, dental public health. When you say, I don't like to extract teeth and I don't like to do endo, well, you need to finish the sentence saying, and I gave my diploma to someone who actually wanted to be a real doctor and he lived in Mexico and he came on all the way up to um, my town and he's working now. So that... Endodontists and oral surgeons are the emergency room doctors of, of dentistry. Could you imagine going to the hospital because you broke your leg and they go, sorry, we don't do legs. Um, I went to McGill and we do arms and ears, but we just don't like legs and we, we don't do legs. And if you broke your leg, you got to go all the way to British Vancouver. I mean, uh, you know, it's crazy. Real doctors get rid of your pain and infection. That means extracting a tooth, doing a root canal. That is ground zero. And when I see a bread and butter office that can pull your tooth or do the root canal, they're always at the top. They're always making the most money. And then when I see the dentist, they say, well, I don't, I don't like that. And I say, well, what, what, how old were you when you found out that life would contain something you don't like? I mean, Sapiens, 200,000 years old. We've already lived through two ice ages. Your ancestors lived, were frozen in caves during an ice age, eating mastodon shit all winter, just so you could be bored and say, I don't like it, no. I don't want to do it. Well, your great grandma didn't like to eat mastodon shit, but she did it so that you would survive and you need to get on some mastodon shit and start pulling teeth and doing endo, okay? So oral surgery, endo, that's a given. Periodontal disease, given. Pediatric dentist, I'd rather just go to hell right now. Uh, I don't know why people become pediatric dentists. I assume they dropped acid and when they came to, they said, I want to work with crying, screaming children every day for from 8 to 5, from 25. Thank God there's pediatric dentists. I don't know how they do it, but, man, they should all get a trophy. Orthodontics. Why is orthodontics so important? That specialty has 11,000 orthodontics. You cut it in half. Each half is bigger than the next two, which is oral surgery and endodontics and periodontics. I mean, it's kind of like Alaska. If you cut Alaska in half, each half is bigger than the second largest state of um, Texas. Thank you very much for that one, Russia. Um, But the bottom line is, Actually, we like to sell from Napoleon better. That was the whole Louisiana purchase deal. That was the best real estate deal I've seen gone down. But orthodontics is so important. Why? Because you only have one job. Your only job is to find another primate and mix gametes with them in the gamete incubator. One of you is supposed to project the gamete. The other one's supposed to catch it and incubate it. And if you don't project, catch, and incubate a gamete, we're extinct like 99.8% of all the species behind us in the last 5 billion years. So mom is trying to fix up her daughter 
It's the peacock effect. Right now, her daughter looks like she could eat corn on the cob through a chain link fence. Mama knows no one's going to mate with her. She's either going to have to be a nun or euthanized. And so they bring him in and say, can you just fix her up enough so that someone will choose her to mate? So that's going to be a big growing business. Anything that has to do with anything that will increase your chance of mating. Like, um, you know someone's really good looking when they ride a bike. I mean, you know, you... You got to be hot. If you can get a date on a bike, you're hot. If you have a Mercedes Benz and you need a big $100,000 car with a logo, you're so ugly, man. I don't even want to see who's driving that car. Um, So they're going to do anything they can to increase their game theory chance to be mateable. Prosthodontics, um, dental anesthesiology. I mean, come on, man. I mean, and don't become an anesthesiologist because you're not an anesthesiologist. When when women go in and have a baby and they decide they want to do it, um, Dr. Lamaze method. Um, Dr. Lamaze, remember, it's a man who never had a baby who says you don't need an IV and just breathe hard. I'd love if anybody could ever raise that guy from the dead. I want to bring in my office and pull all four of his wisdom teeth saying, it's just pressure. Just breathe. Just hold my hand and breathe. It's just pressure. It's just pressure. It's just pressure. I want to pull all four of Dr. Lamaze's wisdom teeth without any anesthesia. But if you go in the hospital at 3 o'clock in the morning and say, uh, I want an IV, they, they, they just set out a pager and the guy shows up in five minutes. So why are you learning IV sedation? You don't need to do IV sedation. In fact, a lot of times this is a really big case where they want IV sedation and they want like four molar root canals. I don't want to do four molar root canals. At that point, I'd rather eat Mastodon shit. So I'll, I'll have an endodontist come in. And I'll pay him 50% of the fee, like do four molars with IV sedation, then when you're done, I'll come in and do the crown preps or whatever. But then there's oral facial pain, oral fa- oral medicine. Are you kidding me? Oral medicine? There's 132,000 registered pharmaceutical chemicals that Sapien has collected since we started doing pharmaceutical shit. How are you going to know 132,000 chemicals. I mean, I know you got an A in organic chemistry and you're all that in a bag of chips, but really, it's especially oral medicine, oral path, oral radiology. But if you stay in school, you're going to make another $100,000 a year if you specialize. Um, treat other people like you want to be treated. Look how that's violated. My two oldest sisters are nuns, and my oldest one tells me that when you study every major religion from Hinduism, Judaism, Buddhism, Confucius, Islam, There's not a name of a person, place, or thing that shows up in all the works except the golden rule. And we violate it every day. Like, if I needed to have a toothache, well, I wouldn't let somebody who just graduated from McGill do my molar root canal, and he's only done three. I would go to an endodontist. So then you got to sit there and think, well, then why, why would you hire someone out of school to do a molar root canal on a kid? Well, we see that going away. Why is it going away? Well, number one, let's take it down. Number one, when general dentists do a molar root canal, in five years, 10% of them are extracted. When an endodontist does it in 10 years, I mean in five years, only 5%. So the endodontists have half the failure rate. So the endodontists, 5% fell in five years, general dentists 10%. But what happens when they fail? America has a million MDs and a million attorneys. When the root canal fails, they'll sit there and say, well, you should have sent it to an endodontist. So you got a legal problem. They never go after specialists because who's going to hang the specialist? Number two, the insurance will pay me $750 to do a molar root canal. They'll pay the endodontist $1,300. The general dentists in my office, they get paid 25%. They, uh, the specialists get paid 50%. We'll do the math. Would you rather have 25% of $700 and have a double failure rate and a chance of getting sued? Or would you rather make 50% of 1300 So you're already seeing the DS SOs taking molar endo off the table for general dentists. And it's the same thing with implants. Here's what used to happen 10 years ago. You come out of school and you go work for some uh, DSO or some private practice. And you say, you know what? I'm going to send you to an implant school. Yeah, I'm going to send you to Dominican Republic with Aaron Garg. And you're going to be an implantologist when you grow up. And you go down there for your weekend course. And you come back and you drop an implant like once a month uh, for 12 months. And the staff turnover of dentists coming out of school, they don't keep any of their jobs for a year. When you been out of school five years you've had five different jobs you will go from job to job to job to job until you're so damn miserable you will finally do what i did right out of school i graduated may 11 i had my office open september 21st 
I mean, I mean, you. I watched you guys walk around the swimming pool for five years, dipping your toe in the water, and you're like, oh, I think it's cold. Yeah, you got to go from job to job to job till you're so damn miserable, you actually dive in the pool because you think it's hot lava and you'll, it'll finally just kill you and it'll be over. You know what I mean? That's how miserable you have to get to get over the fear of starting your own business. Um, so, my gosh, um, the 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 um, the the insurance companies. Uh, are paying more for specialty. Um, treat other people like you want to be treated. And it wants to do it better than you. Um, my gosh, uh, the speed, the consumer. But here's the deal. The specialists are trying to, um, they all want to have their own place because everybody's a tribal monkey, right? I mean, to tell you how, you don't have to tell me about your mother-in-law because I already know. Because we all started on that eastern rift in Africa. And the next generation said, we, we need to move away from your dad. Well, now they've moved away all the way from Australia to Argentina. I mean, you guys have spread up. Look at all the species. A woodpecker pecks that hole all day long for his own hole. He don't want to go live in the hole with his brother or his sister or his mom. People don't like people. They need other people, but they don't know because some people are predator and some people are prey. I don't know if I can use you to my benefit or if you're going to eat me. I'm So it's kind of a predator-prey uh, relationship that uh, bounces around like that. Uh, but the bottom line is... Um, you, 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 you got to look out for yourself. You, you got to build your own dental office. You got to own your own means of production. And then you can do what you like. And success leaves clues. And I see no clues that getting out and working for another dentist made you happy and live uh, happily ever after. We see this in other business. Like, look at the, um, um, the uh, um, what is it? Clear Choice. They took the oral surgeon placing them, the prosthodontist restoring them, and the lab tech making them. One plus one plus one does not equal three. It equals five because that thing is so profitable, but it's been bought and sold five times. I mean, they're doing about 18,000 arches a year for $25,000. And if $25,000 seems like a lot of money to you, just remember that in the United States, um, the average American uh, from age 16 to 74 will buy no less than, where well, I'm going to pull up the right stat, uh, they will buy, uh, where is that? Uh, the, the average new car price in America is 33560 Source Kelly Blue Book and USA Today. On average, you'll buy 13 new cars by age 76. So you have no problem buying 13 cars in your lifetime for 33500 apiece, yet 90% of the dentists will go their whole career without selling one treatment plan worth that because... In your mindset, you're you're that insurance-driven uh, mentality where you'll say, well, your, your mouth looks like a bomb went off, but the worst tooth in your whole head is your molar. So we'll just, the insurance only pay for one tooth a year, so we'll just do a root canal and a crown on one tooth, and then next year we'll do the next shittiest tooth in your mouth. It's like you just deprived them of driving off the car lot in a new car because you look at the patient. Well, what is their insurance going to pay? I don't know. It's a human. They buy their own houses and cars and trips to Hawaii and Disneyland. Why does someone else have to pay for their body? I would think the government should pay for your house and car, not your damn liver and kidney. But about you'll go in any dental office in America with about eight or nine dentists in one building and five and, and all but one will go their whole life and never do one thirty-three thousand on dream plan. And the other guy on his sign says he just works Monday through Thursday. But every Friday he goes in, an anesthesiologist meets him, puts out the patient, there's a lot of endo, and endodontists will meet him, whatever. And every Friday they'll do a twenty-five to fifty thousand dollar case their whole life. And everybody else is is grossing like seven fifty, taking home one fifty. And this guy's doing like one point eight, taking home six hundred thousand a year. And the only difference is no one's better, smarter, better clinical. I can't find anything like that. It's just one guy will look at you and say, Hey, dude, look, um, you, you got to tell me what you want. I mean, imagine you're going on a car. Um, most car sold are used cars. I could sell you a used car. Um, it looks like you're in pain. Um, you got five cavities. We could do a root canal or extract it. We could do these cavities, whatever. Uh, but, dude, you're 40 years old. If you want, if you sit there and said, I want a brand new set of teeth, well, the average new car in America is 33000 and it's not going to cost that much. But for twenty five grand, man, you could look like a movie star. So you got to help me out here. Do you just, are you just trying to do – if you if you want to do the lowest cost, get out of here. You know, just just leave. Uh, do nothing. I mean, you're not going to die from a cavity. I don't know anybody who died from a cavity. So if you don't want to do spend any money, just leave. If you want to do just the basic, just keep me out of pain. Let let's just do basically what the insurance will pay. 
But if you want a brand new car, dude, um, in your mouth, it's going to be 25 grand. Um, it, it's whatever you want to do. I'm here for you. What do you want to do? Now, obviously, 20 people are going to say no. But once a week, someone's going to say, oh, my God. I would love to just look in the mirror and see movie star teeth, But I can't because I'm afraid. Well, you know what? Friday, we'll have an anesthesia. Did you have any babies? Did you ever have an epidural? My God, I got an anesthesiologist. He'll put you to sleep. He won't know what's, what's going on. And when you wake up, you'll be done. Like, oh, my God. I, I want to do that. But you don't even offer that. I mean, it's not even, you won't even offer it because you're a doctor, and that's what government does. Government is always a bunch of people that has, like, five options, and they spend all day taking away your only one option. Like in Guadalupe. Their only option is that a poor Mexican dentist from Mexico comes up and works in their village. And the government thought, well, we all have free dental benefits and insurance, so let's get together and take away their one option because we don't think it should be a Mexican dentist. We think it should be someone from Arizona licensed by the state board. Okay, why don't you just recommend that they go to an Arizona dentist licensed by the state board? But you didn't just recommend it. You took away the option for an individual human to get treatment from someone else. So the, it's always the rich taking away the options for the poor, and then the poor go back to the rich and are always like, will you help us? No, dude, they're the ones that, that ruined you. Pediatric dentistry and orthodontics, same thing. Go look at 200 years from G.V. Black, I mean G.V. Black, from Adam Smith with Wealth of Nations, 1776, which was free, mar uh, free markets, the first business guy. And then you have the, the uh, Constitution, the Declaration of Independence in 1776 by another 32 year old Scottish guys. Two 32-year-old Scottish guys changed our continent. One wrote about free markets and one wrote about free people. And it was a thermonuclear explosion to where 200 years later, 5% of the world's population is sitting on about a quarter of the wealth just from free markets combining by with free people. Uh, but in, in retail, what you've seen is back then, the shops were about the size of a car and you lived upstairs in the shop house, okay? The next generation said, I know how many you out of business you guys sell bread and you sell vegetables we're gonna put bread and vegetables under one roof and the next generation said oh yeah well we're gonna add a butcher and the next guy said oh we're gonna add small grains and canned goods and and it got all the way from a shop house to 200,000 years later getting to about 200,050 square foot in your biggest walmarts and home depots and all that stuff and that's when they realized they hit the upper limit because now it was just too damn big and people were like well i don't want to i don't want to do all that for a gallon of milk and a loaf of bread so they did reach their peak so retail dentistry is not even born yet. You, you, you go to a pediatric dentist. They, they got to be deaf or blind because if, if 100 moms bring in Billy, 100 times the mom will say, is Billy going to need braces? Ah, uh, shit if I know. Uh, you need to, here, you need to go to an orthodontist. Let me get a pad. And you're going to have to go somewhere else. Go to another stranger. Fill out new. I mean, come on. If you walked in, if if every single customer walked in Walmart and said, I want uh, weed that smells like jelly beans, Walmart would make it happen. Nobody, nobody would do this except dentistry or the government. So you're going to see pediatric dentists and orthodontists go one plus one equals three. I'm already seeing that. You see an individual pediatric dentist open. You see an orthodontist open into two or three or four years. They're both doing X. And then you see a pediatric dentist and an orthodontist go in together. And the end of first year, they're already doing three X. It's obvious. Um, clear choice is obvious. Um, periodontist and prosthodontist. Um, implantology. You say you want to be an implantology. The other guy says he wants to be a prosthodontist. By the way, the prosthodontist really freaked out my sister when I started my own magazine, Dental Town, in 1994. And the only reason I started it is because I published, I got four articles published in JADA, Journal American Dental Association. I'd write my article, and then when it came out and I read it, it's like I didn't even recognize it. It's like, what? You you took out, uh, they, and I called them up and said, well, why did you, they got, they know, and everything, well, Howard, you can't see that. You might offend somebody. Might offend someone. I'm trying to get them to think. And I realized that the only place that would ever publish my garbage would be if I owned the damn magazine. You also notice my column comes first. What are the odds of that? That my column comes first in my own damn magazine. I call my podcast Dennis Uncensored. You know why? Because I think the crime is if I was trying to tell you what you wanted to hear. I mean, when you listen to me, you might not like, you might say he's a crazy son of a bitch. I don't agree with anything he says. 
But at least you do know one thing. How he told you what he thought, when you're talking to a man wearing a tie, the first thing you're thinking is, well, I know he's lying because his lips are moving. I mean, why else would he have a tie keeping his foreskin from coming up over his head? I mean, uh, the, you know, a tie means I'm professionally lying to you. And I am not going to lie to you. I'm going to tell you everything I think, right or wrong. Um, but my gosh, retail dentistry is going to come out. Now, remember, there's only three publicly traded dental companies on earth. And two of them are in Australia. And that's uh, one 300 Smiles. And the other one is, um, um, oh, what's the name of that one? Uh, da, 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 da. One 300 Smiles and Pacific Dental, is it? Is it Pacific? Uh, yeah, let me find that. Uh, oh, my gosh, where is that name? Um, yeah, one 300 Smiles and Pacific Smiles Group in Australia, and then there's Q and M uh, and with um, in uh, Singapore. And um, my gosh, what? There's no publicly traded dental office in America now. Think of I want to go through that journey there because it means a lot to you. Because right now you're always thinking about DSOs, but you're too damn young. You weren't even born when the first round of DSOs. Just raise your hand. I can see five people now. Raise your hand if you were not born in 1994. Oh, thank you for ruining my day. You just you just really had to, re at least one of you could have lied. But the bottom line, it was Orthodontic Centers of America, uh, Gaspar Lazarus, um, did the biggest revolution in dentistry where he thought to himself like, why does orthodontists need a third down? I mean, if you went and got your mani-pedi down, let's just say hypothetically, uh, you get a mani-pedi once a month. It's 100 bucks, easy math, just ones and a zero placement. And he says, okay, well, you want a mani-pedi and it's 100 bucks. Uh, so I'm going to sell you a two-year uh, contract and it's $2,400. I'll need $1,000 down and then I'll finance the remaining $1,400 at 10%. And you're like, why do I have to finance Two years of Manny Petties. Oh, because my dad was an orthodontist. And I saw how people were so stupid there that I thought I'd bring that stupidity to Manny Petties. I mean, you only incur costs when you come in to get your Manny Petty. The orthodontist cost is 35% as the orthodontist, 25% staff, 10% supplies, lab, labor. I, I mean, you only incur cost as cost comes in. Why are you financing? And if I paid $6,500 for the orthodontics, are you gonna are you going to prepay your rent, mortgage equipment, build out computer? insurance malpractice uh, your staff all that no so you're financing nothing that's why when you see companies say zero percent financing zero percent interest no money down okay that means we just got rid of banking and financing so you're not financing something it's a scam and what is the scam orthodontics where i'm prepaying for one third down when i can take a cbct for a dollar, the average set of brackets, okay, another dollar. I've, it's, it's like I got $2 into this, so I'm going to need at least a third down. It's like it ended on us. How much do you charge for a root canal? Well, the rubber dam's a dollar, and the gutta perch is a dollar, and the sealer is 25 cents. So I'm thinking 1300 uh, how, how do, uh, that, that, that's the math I'm getting in my head. Uh, so the, the bottom, the bottom line is Gasper goes out there. He goes publicly traded. The only one to date ever that made it on the New York Stock Exchange under dental DSO. And it failed miserably for all the same reasons they're all failing today. And Wall Street will never touch them. Now look at NASDAQ. They, they, Snapchat went public. You know what Snapchat was designed for? So that you could take a selfie nudie picture, send it to someone, and they open it and it disappears. Oh, yeah, that can go public. But not 123 Dental, not Heartland, not Aspen, not Fontana. None of those can go public. But a porn app can go public. But not you. Why? Because it, the, the costs are completely out of control. The only ones that gone public, they only have one business model. And you, don't, and you might not like the business model, but I'm not here. To, I don't care if you like it or not. I'm not here. This isn't let's make a friend. This is dentistry uncensored. I'm just telling you what is. I'm not saying I like it or don't like it. I'm just telling. I mean, there's a moon in the sky. You may, you may say, you know what I hate most about life? That damn moon up there. The hell is it following us around for? It just is, okay? Their their model is seven to seven, seven days a week. So we already proven in two different continents of Australia and Asia that um, your toothache, you don't have to go to the hospital in the middle of the night. The emergency rooms can usually confirm this, okay? If I can get in at seven in the morning, I don't need to go to the emergency room at three o'clock in the morning. They don't have hygienists. And now hygienists say, well, you, 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 why? Well, here's why. Okay, think about this. The hygienist, I spent an hour pulling four wisdom teeth and the insurance will give me a, you know, I don't know, 
thousand dollars. A hygienist spends an hour cleaning teeth, and they'll give her fifty. Okay, I, I don't know why that is. I didn't set the price. Rule number one, never go into a business where someone else sets your prices or if it's capital intensive. What is healthcare? Extremely capital intensive and someone else sets your prices. So I know when I look at dentists, that's what I love about dentists. I mean, they didn't want to go to eight years of college to be a lawyer just so they could screw people. They actually wanted to help other people with their hands. I mean, people come in, they're in pain. I love dentists. They, they went into a high capital business where someone else sets their price just because they, they're that type of person. And I, I, I love dentists. They're all nurturing. They're all, they're, they're so much more human uh, than some other occupations. I mean, they, they really are special people. Um, but when you sit there and go in there, here's the deal. So the hygienist is getting paid $40 an hour. So she's setting up a room for 10 minutes that a $20 an hour assistant could set up. So that don't make any sense. Why are you having a $40 set up a room and a $20? And then she takes the bite wings and the x-rays at 40 an hour when a high assistant could do it for 20. And then, and then when she starts probing, she needs an assistant. So now I got a $40 an hour hygienist, $20 an hour assistant doing a cleaning for $50. $55, you know, what does the math tell you? And then when she's all done, she goes to get the doctor for an exam and the average doctor says he has to wait 10 minutes uh, for the um, exam. By the, by the way, we're at 40 minutes, so anytime you want to, um, um, you know, just go, this is five minutes to go, this is two minutes, this is shut the hell up, we're down to one minute, this is for two minutes over, get off the screen, but I'll finish this rant, I'll, I'll go as long as you want me to go, but the deal is, the average hygienist tells me she has to wait 10 minutes for the doctor. So then we look at the new patient exam and the new patient treatment plan for the average doctor is probably like almost a $1,000. Um, and the uh, recall, it's, it's actually, I'm sorry, I don't know why I said that. It's a, it's a little under $400. And then you look at the recall exam dentistry sold and it, it, it's south of 100 so it's like, well, how come when a doctor does a new patient exam, he does, and I'll get that exact number for you. What is the average uh, uh, new patient exam? Um, I will find that for you right here. It is. Thank you, Dr. Farad. I'll just jump in. I'll let you know that we have 10 minutes left uh, until 730 while, while you look that number up. So uh, maybe we can just take a few questions also from the, from the group if they have any. Uh, oh. So just send us, send us a shout out, uh, guys, if you have any questions. Okay, I'll just finish that rant, and then we'll go to questions. So the average new treatment plan was 384, and then the average recall exam isn't even 84. So what is the difference? The difference is it correlates most of the number of minutes you send in there. See, when I have a $20 an hour assistant set up the room, go get the patient, take the x-rays, and then the doctor comes in, the assistant uh, does the, uh, records the probing, and then you have to sit there for about 15 minutes, and you have to scale the tooth. Well, that's when you're doing the exam. You're talking to the patient. You're running for mare. You're pressing the flesh, and if we get you in there, if we keep you in that room for 15 minutes, we got about a $384 accepted treatment, and if we only keep you in that room for five minutes, we don't even have $80, so we get rid of the four $40 hour hygienist, well, that's the overhead. That's the difference between having a 5% net income to a, uh, an, add another 12. You know, usually front office staff are about 10% overhead, hygienist about 10% overhead. So now you got a 5% business, you just threw on another 10%, you got a 15% net. That's why they're publicly traded. So the bottom line is you can't afford hygienists for those fees. And if you don't, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish on this. You know, when a dentist gets done, I mean, uh, you take it all day long. They, they finish the root canal. When they get done, if your dad's a dentist, what does he do? He goes to his private office and he shuts the door. What do the millionaires do? They go work the room. When you go in the nicest restaurant in Montreal, where's the chef? Is he back there stirring garbazo beans because he's a chef? No, he's out there working the room and buying you a shot and telling, oh, thanks for coming back. And, and he's working the whole room. When I get done doing dentistry, I'm up at the front. I'm working the room. I'm, pre I'm always running for mayor. And they refer other people to you because you made them feel good. They wouldn't know the difference between a good filling and a bad filling. They wouldn't know the difference between amalgam and gold. You just, did they like you? Were you out there? Were you working hard? Were you hustling? And that's all I have to say. <laughs> uh, you guys are probably wondering, okay, what asshole signed up Howard? And we're going to beat the crap out of him after the show. Who's going to get mugged for inviting me to come speak to your group? Thank you. Thank you again, Howard. Obviously, 
you know, uh, we're all from a social system or uh, you have universal healthcare here. So, uh, I, I think uh, it would be nice if we have some questions from the group, uh, just because everything that you're saying is a lot, especially applies to the States, right. And, and, and where you're from. So, uh, if anyone has well, anything, I, w- that- I, w- I wouldn't say that cause I've lectured in 50 countries. I mean, my, my brother lives in Australia. I've, I've lectured in uh, Africa has 58 countries. I've lectured in half of Africa. So I've been around the world, and I, I've, um, my mom's on Social Security. I, I get all that, but I just don't know why my mom's on Social Security, but it's illegal for her to see a dentist from India. Uh, you know, you go, to, you go to America, like 400 people apply to a dental school, and they accept 100. I've been to dental schools in India where 50,000 kids apply to a dental school in New Delhi, and they accept 50. Why is that guy not allowed to practice in Wichita, Kansas on a Saturday or a Sunday when all the other doctors are closed because the government board? So I'm not saying the government can't do something good. I'm just saying that they're more bad than good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no problem. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that, uh, you know, we know you oh, no, need no, no, lecture no, no, all no, over, no. Uh, all over. I meant maybe some of the numbers uh, were applied yeah. more in the States. Uh, but uh, thank you again. So we I have know a Sahil warm, has round, a of, round of applause. It looks like Lorenzo has has his hand up. Lorenzo, do you have a question for uh, Howard? Yes, uh, I do. Hello, uh, I'm Lorenzo. It's it's. I mean, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm a huge I'm a huge fan of downtown. And oh, thanks, I've been man. Your podcast before. Um, I've heard you on your podcast kind of do the rant before about um, specializing and owning your own business. So. I mean, my question specifically with that is, um, you know, I always look at it. I come from a philosophy of wanting to be a specialist, kind of the same reasoning with the golden rule and that sort of concept, but I know it's a big lifetime commitment. So how, I mean, what do you think would be a good time to go into specialty if you're not certain that you've like found that passion yet? Like how long before you should, you know, just give up and say, you know what, I'm going to stay GP or how long until, you know, it's like no longer a right time to kind of be considering that. First of all, that's a really great question. When I went to MBA school, um, I was older. I, I graduated in 87. I went in 98. I was born in 62. What's 98 minus 62. That's 30, 36 or whatever. And um, my God, I looked at the kids who after they finished their four-year degree went right into the MBA program. And I, I mean, I, I had to wipe their boogers out of their nose. And I mean, they, they, uh, so it was really good for me to be in the real world and own a dental office for a decade before I went back. Um, I would, number one, if you really want to be a pediatric dentist, you know, and, and we're talking about after you've seen a psychiatrist and shared that information with your friends and family to give them a chance to talk you out of it. Um, if you really want to do something, you, you go do it. Um, but yeah, coming out of dental school and getting a job and getting your basics. I mean, like if you want to play American NFL football, you need to learn how to do a block, a tackle, a pass, and a catch. Um, nothing wrong with coming out of school and figuring out what you're doing that. Nothing wrong with getting a DSO. The worst thing, the, the trade-off, I don't like to think of things in right and wrong. Uh, or good and bad. I mean, everything's a trade-off. Do you want a car that's fuel efficient or one that's good in a crash? I mean, if if you want the fastest car, it's not going to be the most fuel efficient car. So everything's a trade-off. It's not right and wrong and good and bad. And, you know, I still am haunted by every once in a while. I'll see a root canal and I'll think, what idiot did that root canal? I mean, that is the worst root canal I've ever seen. That guy should have his license taken away. And my assistant who's been with me 30 years says, Howard, you did that in 1987, and I'm like, oh, my God. Um, I I can't tell you how much it'd be really nice. If you were going to practice in Montreal your whole life, you should go to Vancouver for the first year and place all your failed implants and root canals, and then when you finally learn how to do it, come back to your side of Canada and get them right. So there's no good or right time. And then the other thing, when I was in dental school, there was a 50-year-old guy in the class named Joe DiCiano who was an Italian restaurant guy, and his whole life he wanted to be a dentist. So there's, there's a, right now, I have a lot of old friends 
who realize that after uh, 30, 40 years of dentistry, they're, they're going to law school. And I don't know if you know about American law, but American law school, that's, that's the only degree where if you just go to the government and pass the exam, you're a lawyer. In the Constitution, you don't have to go to somebody's brick building to become a lawyer uh, for a lot of these states. But um, I think education is a lifelong passion. There's also the quarterback thing. Like, um, if you just really want to make money, I'll give you a story of where when life has you lemon, make lemonade. When I, when I got into town here, um, there was um, DSOs really start it's really not, there's no such thing as DSO. I mean, um, that, that's like saying an ocean doesn't have H2O. It starts with a group practice. You have a solo dentist and he wants a friend. I graduated from dental school with 120 classmates and I came and I was practicing by myself. I was withdrawing. Um, so I hired another guy. Now, if I was smart, I would have hired an old guy to tell me what to do. But I hired someone equally young and dumb as me. It was dumb and dumber. We were both 25 years old. I don't know why my first associate was 25, but I loved him, and we had so much fun and all that kind of stuff. But there was a woman that came here um, in, um, uh, during the uh, uh, Nazi occupation of Germany, and when she got here, um, they told her they, um, they didn't accept her license, which is very understandable because they make Mercedes-Benz and we make Chrysler, so obviously um, you, know, you can't let some Mercedes-Benz dentist come in. And um, she cried and cried and cried, and she got a lawyer. And they said, well, you got to go back to dental school, man. It's, it's the mafia. It's, it's, it's a racket. And she goes, but the loophole is you can own a dental office. So she couldn't do dentistry. So she had to hire a dentist. So by the time I hook up with her, she's 80 years old, being driven around in a limo. She has four dental offices, north, south, east, and west. She's doing like $10 million a year. She's netting $2 million. And she's telling me, Howie, uh, since they took my freedom away, I was forced to be a business owner. So when you're looking at ortho school, you know, is it all about you or is it about the patient? Like if I was a pediatric dentist, I wouldn't say, well, I'm going to go back to school and be a pediatric dentist and an orthodontist and I can answer all their questions. I, a business person is a conductor. He has his back to the audience. I don't see everyone in the deal. I'm, and if I need a drummer, well, I'm not going to go to drumming school. I'm going to hire a drummer. If I need a violinist, I'm not going to go learn the violin and the cello. And where does it stop? I mean, I've been to symphonies where she that there's a hundred people up there. Are you going to go get a hundred graduate degrees? So a, condu- a billionaire is a conductor. He's like, you know what? Here's what I need. I'm going to set up. Uh, I, I want to go to pediatric dentistry school, but screw that. I mean, I'm just going to open up a dental office and hire a pediatric dentist and an orthodontist and call it all, all under uh, mom, all under one roof dental or what, whatever the hell. Um, so I, I recommend going to do it if you just want, if you just think it's fun, I mean, if you think it's fun, you only, you're only going to live one time, a hundred years and it's over. Okay. So have fun. If it's fun, go do it. But if you're sitting there saying, well, it's not fun, but it's more the delayed gratification where I'm going to give up fun and, and borrow other people's money with interest and suffer for three more years. Cause I think it'll help the back 30 years. Well, I, I want to know exactly what that strategy is. Um, because, um, and by the way, when I went to MBA schools, when I bought my first laptop in 98 and I took notes all the way through there and when I was done, it was 30 hours long. So I called it Dr. Franz 30 day dental MBA. It's free on on YouTube. It's free on iTunes. Um, so if you want to go to get your MBA degree, dude, I took the notes like a nun for two years and posted them. It's all free. Um, but what I would do is I, I would, I would, um, if it's fun, go have fun. But if it's a businessman, I'd be a conductor. Thank Did that you. answer your question? It was, it's, I mean, it's a lot to think about. I mean, these are big life decisions, but no. And, I, I, and, I, and big life decisions, you see it all the time. Like you'll see like they have a big life decision. So they'll go ask their alcoholic friend and then they'll go ask the, the nun. And it's like, what are you doing? And then, I mean, you, you'll have a, a financial question. So you'll go ask someone who um, has gone bankrupt three times. Then you'll go ask, uh, you know. So the bottom line is, is I think the one thing the great minds do is they get comfortable in their own skin, and when they got a big decision, they they spend time looking in the mirror and thinking. And because whoever you go ask is just a product of your sexually transmitted disease of the location you were born. I mean, notice how you're not going to ask anybody in Russia and China and Iran. 
because you're in Canada. So you're geographically limited. So on those soul searching questions, get comfortable in your own skin. Do it after a, a breakup. The breakup, you know, when you see a friend suffering from breakup, like, oh my God, I lost the love of my life. Oh, let me guess, let me guess. The love of your life, you, you were born in Parsons, Kansas, and she was too. What were the odds of that? I mean, my God, you should have won the lot. So when you see a friend with a lot of pain breaking up, you're looking at someone who who's, can't be alone, who can't be in their own skin. Those are the people always asking advice. They cry during a breakup, and they're always asking other people's advice. And you know what? A good breakup, the best thing to do is get your heart broken in high school so you get that shit out of your system so it doesn't happen in college because even in dental school, we lost like four guys. One of my friends who's a dentist, and I don't want to say his name because it might get back to J.C. Stanley, uh, but in, uh, but like four of us had to go over there and rough him up because he was all crying about some breakup. We're like, oh, okay, 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 but we got a biochem test Friday and you're going to flunk. And the instructor told us if you flunk that test, he's kicking you out of the school. And, and, and um, I remember sitting at a table and he would start to talk about, I think her name was Michelle. And my friend Stike would just go smack. And he's like, ah, but it took like an hour for this guy to get out of the zone and start getting back into biochem. So soul search, the deep ones only you can answer and no one else can answer the deep ones for you. Thank you. This is, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Oh, <laughs> it's fun. Okay, to Ann yeah. Wen has three questions. I can tell just by looking in her eyes. She has three questions right now. Just, just ask the third one, then the first one, and then the second one. Come on, Tuan. I know I, I can, I can telepathically see your question. Uh, sure, it was an amazing talk. <laughs> I really, did. I really loved hearing you. But um, what would you say is your key lesson in, in someone wanting to go in to own their own practice, like you said? I, I, I the same advice as starting a family. Um, you know, um, you go back um for the last two hundred thousand years, they were starting families. You know, in very very young at the in nineteen forty five, they were starting families at sixteen. Now it's backed up twenty seven, and you start overthinking it, and you overthink it and overthink it. I walked out of school. I decided I'm going to open up my own now and start my family now. I made four boys in 60 months. That's pretty damn good to knock out four kids in 60 months. Now, it's going to be crazy. You're not going to die. You're not going to go bankrupt. You're going to have your family. But the longer you think about the pros and cons of having a kid, the next, you'll be in the middle of a root canal, and all of a sudden you'll start obtrading your own uh, vast deferens, and you know you'll you'll give yourself a uh, uh, you know you'll sterilize yourself. You just don't overthink it. I mean, you're not going to die. You just open up your own. But you know you want to own your own means of production. You know you want to own your own place, and you know you want to have a kid. But let me let me tell you about having four kids in sixty months. I basically didn't sleep for a decade. I mean, it'd be like two o'clock in the morning and wanted to throw up. Uh, the next day, someone would come. I, I remember one time Eric woke me up at like four o'clock because he was hungry and he wanted Cheerios. And I had a molar endo at seven and it's like 430 in the morning. And he's eating his Cheerios one Cheerio at a time. And I'm just sitting there with my hands behind my back just so I don't start choking him. And, uh, you know, I'm letting, you know, it, I mean, it, it was crazy opening up your own business. You had to learn. HR and marketing and accounting and it was just crazy. But you know what? How how old are you? Do you mind if I ask how old you are? Me? Yeah. I'm 23. Okay, you're a baby. You're a baby. You have 10 times more energy than your mom and your grandma. You don't want to be sitting there saying, I'm 58. You don't want to sit 58 and say, you know, I'm finally going to start that family and have four kids now and start my own business. I mean, no, you're uh, not done to be rude, but you're young, you're dumb, you don't know everything that's going to happen, and you're and and the more time you spend learning about all the horrible reasons why you should never have a kid or own your own business, you're going to talk yourself out of it, and then you might miss that zone, and then what they because what the DSOs will do is they'll give you just enough money to kill all your dreams. Because the longer you got this basic pay, you're like, well, I don't know. I, I took that basic pay and I got the minimum house I could afford and the minimum car I can afford. And, and now I'm like addicted to this minimum pay. So now all your dreams die. And they calculate how much money will it cost to kill all of her dreams. And they'll do it. So youth is good because 
It's your first rodeo. You've never seen a giraffe, and you think, you know what? I'm going to own my own business. I'm going to marry my buddy Charlie, and we're going to knock out two kids. And all three of those are amazingly great ideas, but you have no idea what kind of ride that you're going to be on for the next 10. And then as soon as that 10 is over, now you're a rich dentist. And by the way, you want to be a good mom? Um, how, how You know, kids don't, they don't send you calendar invites on Outlook. Uh, they tell you at breakfast that today they're in a play and they really want you to go see them in their play. And now what? You're going to go back to your office manager and you have $4,000 of production. They're, they're needing you to break even. And they're going to tell you, well, hell no, you can't go cancel the play. You want to be the best mom in the world? Own your own place. You know, I told my staff, I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but, you know, I wasn't born to create jobs for you. And if my kid calls in some emergency, sometimes I come out of my office and say, sorry, guys, I got to run. And I know it sucks for everybody, but I own my own practice, and it was my decision. And they did it to me all the time. Sometimes they get home from school at 3 o'clock and say, Dad, 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 I made the wrestling team, and I have a match at 3.30. Can you come to my match? And I'm like, dude, I'm on my way. And I had patients scheduled till 7. You know, it's a staff problem. So if you want, you're either going to learn, you either got to look in the mirror and say, do I like to give orders or take orders? And if you would prefer to give orders and not take orders, especially if you're a highly educated doctor, dentist, lawyer. So just do it. You're young, you're dumb, dive in the swimming pool. You don't want to know how deep it is. You don't want to know how cold it is. Get married, have the kids, open up your own business, and 10 years after you dive in that pool, you're going to look like a genius. You're going to look like the all-American girl, all success. And all the ones who didn't do it is because they were very smart, very cerebral, and start thinking out everything that could go wrong in a chess game. They're basically that person you play chess with that needs like an hour between each move. You know what I mean? So just don't overthink it. Just dive in head first. You're in a rich country. You're highly educated. You're adorable. You're going to be successful. Just go do it. You don't need to overthink it and live in fear. Living in fear is not an option. That was awesome. Thank you so much. I have a question. So uh, every time I look online for a dentist, they all seem to offer Invisalign these days. And uh, Smile Direct Club is popping up everywhere. So I'm wondering for someone who might be considering going into orthodontics and, you know, working in the next 30 years, what, what, what does that look like with, with this much competition from outside the, uh, the specialty? Well, first of all, competition's good. You couldn't win a Stanley Cup if you didn't work out and you didn't have, um, you know, you didn't have other teams to play. So competition is a very good thing. But let's look back at competition. When Orthodontic Centers of America went out, they – revolutionize and uh, orthodontics by saying 0% down, 0% interest, 0% financing, no one's denied. Only 1% of their customers fell off the tree and because hell, they had wires glued in your mouth. You had to eventually go back to the guy who glued all the wires in your mouth. So when they come out with the innovation, now just think about it. Everyone is a narcissist because trees aren't happy or sad. Rocks aren't mean or mad. So if any human has a behavior, that means we're all capable of it. Um, when someone kills something, um, we're all capable of murder. You've been in traffic before where you said, if that guy cuts me off again, I swear to God, I'm going to kill the guy. Um, you know, we, we're all narcissists because there are narcissists and we're all the same species. And so you always think of everything from your own personal framework. But like, look at the orthodontist. Look at some of their innovations. Like, you go to Smile drug club they scan you but they make all 24 of your trays and give them to you one time well now i don't need the cost of rent labor lab supply uh, all this stuff i don't have to see you every damn month for two years you don't have to leave work drive across town come to my parking lot why can't you do that innovation so when smiles direct does something out of nashville tennessee and they can go public well why the hell can't you do it I, and why do you have to sit there and say, well, that's not the way they've done it here in my town. And who is this new guy trying something new? And what you do is you all, like Musk, you all form a circle and just shoot outside your herd, you know, because it's different. What I suggest, I've never had an original idea in my life. I mean, hell, my dad was a, owned a Sonic drive-in and cooked hamburgers. And my next door neighbor was Kenny Anderson, the dentist who's still practicing for the year. So my, my brain, I had to, Go, either go to work the love of my life my dad and make cheeseburgers 
which was really damn fun and good to eat, or I went next door to Kenny, went to work with him, and he was taking x-rays. He could look through a tooth and then do a root canal. Oh, I mean, it was just love at first sight. I, I applied to my dental school in the sixth grade, and Diane Beard kept the letter. I mean, my God, I uh, just just uh, loved it. But the bottom line is, um, went, went dental town. I was on ESPN and, and talking football, and I just sat there and said, well, God, I wish I could do that with root canals. So I looked down at the, the bottom of them. It says BBB uh, London Bulletin Board Company and, and said, how much is that software? They said 300 bucks. I said, can I buy it? And they had to mail it in a floppy. And like six weeks later, I got a package in the post office and there was the birth of Dental Town. I mean, my God, I've never had an original idea. So when you see something, well, there's 8 billion people in 208 countries and and... They, they can't even see the ideas in their own country. That's why I got on the road. I wanted to get out of my tribe. I mean, the stuff I learned seeing about what's happening with 1-800-DENTALS and General Dental in Australia, Singapore. The Chinese, oh my God, love the Chinese. They're the happiest, sweetest, nicest people. And they think about... They, they're, they have the same thoughts of their government as everybody in America thinks of our government. I mean, we're just like, let's not talk about our governments. But the bottom line, happy people, happy people, but look at their thoughts on insurance. You know how many times the Chinese debtors lecture me and said, hey, if you drink Coca-Cola and you eat chocolate all day long and you got a cavity, why should your employer have to pay for that cavity? Why should your government have to pay for that? I mean, like Canada, you're like, well, we love our free health care. Really? The guy paid $15 a day for a pack of Marlboro from 16 to 65. Now he needs a $100,000 bypass and he's happy it's free because all you fine folks are going to pay for it? Well, why doesn't he have skin in the game? And you say that if he, if, if everybody had to pay 10% of their benefit, what would they do? Well, first thing they do is start shopping on price. Well, hell, in Montreal and Toronto, this surgery is 50000 for a hip. But if I drive clear in this shit middle of nowhere, I, I assume it's in Manitoba or the Yukon, um, I can get it down for forty. So I'll just cut my co-payment from 5000 to 4000 Yet you're proud that none of your people have a co-payment. So what are you proud of? Should we go back to Adam Smith's 1776 Wealth of Nations today and just throw away economics and say, well, we had a two-century run on economics, uh, but the Canadians decided... It was all a bunch of bullshit. So we threw it all away. Incentives don't matter. Price doesn't matter. I mean, I mean, think I mean, we've learned some things. So when we've learned something, why do we go out of our way to deny the obvious? And co-payments, incentives matter, ownership matter. I guarantee you, if you went and worked at a dental office, I, I don't care how sweet you think you are when you look in the mirror. If you worked in the dental office as an employee or you owned a dental office, who do you think would be more conscientious of not wasting any excess impression material. When you're buying, when when you own your own office and you buy the impression material, notice how you squeeze out just enough to get the impression. But when you're an employee, there's like big gloobs and globs, your shit on the floor. They got impression material on their head because they're not paying the $10 a gram for that shit. Okay, so incentives matter. So in, at this point, I don't even know what the question was, but I think it was something about orthodontics. And um, I would say this. Great question on this front. Dentistry is a 200-year-old profession. It started with um, Pierre Fichard in France. He was a, a barber surgeon and said, let's just do dentistry. And he wrote the first book on it. A hundred years later, North America had G.V. Black. And, um, you know, I got the first three books written by that guy, autographed and signed uh, at an estate sale of an really old dead dentist. Whenever an old, old, old dentist dies, always go to the estate cell. There's some really cool shit in that place. And the bottom, the bottom line is, um, um, my gosh, um, you know, um, everything's flat. Everything only grows with the economy and the interest rate for cleanings, exams, fillings, root canals. If the economy grows 3%, that'll grow 3%. What's the only two things growing double digit? Clear aligners and implants. Why? The peacock effect. No one needs implants because they can't eat. I mean, I can drive you around America and show you 10 million people that don't have any teeth in their head and they're at least 100 pounds overweight. You have, you fill in the missing spaces so you can attract another mate. Um, What we do, the price we pay for mating is, I mean, you think your house and car is expensive. Wait till you figure out your mating cost on your deathbed. Uh, The marriages, the divorces, all that crazy stuff like that. So the bleaching, the bonding veneers, 
That's one direction you can go, but it's a lot less money than the I'm going to get you out of pain oral surgery endo. So make no bones about it. If you want to make bank and you want to have customers begging for you, then you go into oral surgery and endo. Now, if you're a super slick salesman and just look at you, you could pull it off. I could see you all fancy selling bleaching, bonding veneers. You're going to have to be good in sales. And it's a big demand because everyone wants to look pretty till the day they die. I'll never forget my grandmother. Um, she died at, a, the boy's grandmother, I think she died at 99. She missed 100 by four months. But what used to blow my mind is two things when I go visit her. She still drove her car to the end. But when you go in her bathroom, she still had all the makeup out. And she put the powder on and the lipstick. And I'm thinking... Okay, you're 99 years old. You look like you fell out of a car. Um, you know, you're all black and bruised, but that's not what she saw. And then I'll never forget it. <laughs> My boys would ask her what her husband's name was. Albert died so many years. I mean, they were married like 36 years, and he died like 38 years ago, and she couldn't remember his name. And uh, can you imagine being so damn old you couldn't even remember your your spouse's name that you were married to for four decades so you got a long time you're like a turtle you're not like that hummingbird or the insects where you know you got three months on earth you got a century dude you're a turtle you're a hundred year old turtle so there it's a very slow race you got a lot of time to kill um you got enough time hell you could be you could get 10 different doctorates uh before you were 80 um so i would but, but the two directions of high growth are anything that increases this is my chance of mating and anything that gets me out of pain. And the implant thing is all about mating. It's not about form and function and chewing. Okay. They, they don't want to have an empty space here because they heard Margaret say, you see that snarly tooth guy my sister is with? Hell, he's missing teeth. That man never forgot that. So he's going and filling in those, and you're like, well, are you having problems masticating or chewing your food? Are there any foods you cannot eat at a restaurant? That's not why they're getting bleaching, bonding, veneers, and implants. They want to look, they want the peacock to attract another primate, or they want out of pain. And when they're in pain, they don't care about insurance costs, nothing. They just want it taken care of. So I'd either go, and I can tell where you're going to be by looking at your first root canal. Because you're either an apical barbarian and you get all the way to the apex and have a puff of sealer out the end, or you're this weird dinky guy who stays a half millimeter from the apex to save the terminal uh, canal, and, and you're a pulp lover. If you're a little pulp lover, go get into bleaching bonding veneers. But if you're an apical damn barbarian and you always like to see a puff of sealer out the apex, start extracting teeth, doing root canals, and that's where the big bucks are with no cells attached. That's awesome. Thank you for the answer. <laughs> so are you a pop lover or an apical barbarian? What is it, buddy? I'll find out soon. We're <laughs> starting our freak tomorrow. Okay. Dr. Ferran, I have a question for you. Right on. How do you conduct analytics? Like, do you, and quality assurance, do you have your, like, how do you make sure that your front desk people uh, speak to each patient the same way? Um, that's a really, really good question, and let me say this. Um, people are batshit crazy. Um, after 58 years on Earth, I figured out that I'm the only normal person who lives on Earth, and you're not ever going to get 8 billion people to speak the same way, do the same. There's 1,100 different religions being practiced today, and you go back in time, there's another 10,000. So, well, For the, example, and, and, McDonald's makes the burgers the same way. How do you make sure that your staff conducts themselves the same exact way with each patient? And then that that's a great distinction because the McDonald's and pharmacists are making a product. We're making a service. So the product, if you want to put 28 pills of penicillin in a tab, go to France. You get your prescription on your smart card. You go to an ATM machine. You shove it in. A bottle comes down. 28 pills come down. A label comes on. A cheeseburger, a hamburger, fries. The McDonald's, um, now, since they've raised the minimum wage to $15 an hour, now they've made these equipment to automate all the food and cooking affordable now. So now that they raise the $15 an hour, the remaining employees will be fired and it'll be, it'll be a TM. So you got to separate product and service. I'm selling the invisible. When I go stay in a hotel, the toilet has like a, a, a cardboard sleeve around it. Why? Well, the maid cleaned it. I didn't see the maid. The maid didn't see me. She's selling the invisible. 
I go get a cup, and it's got a little paper deal around the deal. She's saying it's a new cup. She's selling the invisible. But when I tell you, you have four cavities, well, you can't Google that. You don't know if I ever. So now I'm selling invisible. So now you're looking around and saying, do I trust these people? And, and so then the question is, how do you sell trust? How do you train staff? It's not in training the staff and telling them how to answer the phone and giving them sheets. What it is, is getting rid of employee turnover. So, you know, I, I can, it's, my job is so easy because I got a half dozen people that have been with me 20 to 30 years. I don't have, so if I'm taking, if I hire someone, I'm spending time with them, I'm training them, we're doing online CE, we're doing webinars, we're doing all this stuff, and then she quits in a year, and then you got a new one, and a new one, and a new one. Well, here's what I would tell you. Um, you're in, um, were you, uh, um, I assume you're a hockey player because you're from Canada, right? Um, you're a hockey player. I mean, I mean, so the deal is some of these scouts find great players and some of them don't. Like, like so, so I go into an office where there's turnover every year and nobody in the office has been there three years. I say, who does all the hiring and firing? The doctor goes, I do it all. And I'm like, okay, dude, you suck. I mean, how much evidence do you need that you can't pick good long-term players? And then I'm a humble guy. I saw my Lori, who was my bookkeeper, asking better inter- questions during the interview. And I walked out of an interview one day and I said, you know what, dude, you're, you're pff, scale me. I gave up interviewing and HR 20 years ago when I saw Lori in action because I thought, okay, she's going to do it better. So the, and the way to train staff is to reduce employee turnover. Like for instance, um, if someone's in Phoenix, Arizona and they were born in Phoenix and their mom was born in Phoenix, they ain't moving away ever. That's not what humans do. Only 1% of the planet's 8 billion people live in a country today that they weren't born in. The other 99% of the 8 billion humans live in the country they were born in. So um, you know, I'll see Dennis and they'll say, well, yeah, this girl was born in Mexico and her husband's in the Navy the Navy, shit, they move everybody every three years. What the hell would you do that for? So there's, it's a big art and science. And then there's a the culture thing. I mean, there's no right or wrong in culture, but if everybody in your office likes country music and hockey and she likes Led Zeppelin and smokes pot, I mean, it's, is that going to work? So it's all this tribal stuff, but you just need to find, if I owned the Arizona Cardinals, I mean, I would want the scout that got all the good players. Look at how many people were drafted before Michael Jordan. Look at how many number one draft picks were out of the NFL and the NBA in just like two or three years. So you wasted my number one draft pick and the guy couldn't even make the team? Are you shitting me? And in dentistry, we'll say, yeah, but you own the company, so it's your, it's your job. And you're the worst at it, but you can do it from age 25 to 65 until you finally hang yourself and it's over. Or you can be a conductor like I am and say, okay, I'll do, you know, you know what jobs I do? I do all the jobs that nobody else can do that I can find. Um, So, you know, if, if I can like accounting, well, if I can get someone that eats, lives, breathes, shits, dies accounting and loves it, well, why would I want to do it? I'll move on and go look for a drummer and a violinist. So learn to be the conductor. And and, uh, it was a great question, but the answer to staff training is answered by reducing staff turnover. And I wish um, the uh, SEC would make the publicly traded companies report that because it takes a lot of work to find out that the airline companies where the average employee's been there seven years is a much better investment than the companies are four years. And it takes a shitload of work to go through an industry and say, okay, I got seven people in this sector. What is the employee turnover in each one? You know what I mean? So just figure out employee turnover. And, and, and the same skill to keep your wife is the same skill to keep your staff, is the same skill to keep your customers. You're either nice or you're not. And it's an intentional decision to be whichever one you want to be. Thank you for that. Where, where were you born? Where were you born and raised? New York. New York. I'm, actually, I'm not from Canada. I'm you're an NYU dental student. You're what? NYU dental student. And, oh, you're an NYU. Oh, very cool. The largest dental school in America. 70% yeah. of all dentists in America came from NYU. 
Why do you think, why do you think dental, dental hospitals haven't taken off in Canada and America? That's like another great question. And that's why you got to get around the world. And when I, I love to travel the world, I got to tell you, my four boys, they're all out of the house. They all now own their own house and they, they made six kids and all that kind of stuff. They all say to this day that, that, Comparing what they learned in college versus following dad to dental lectures in 50 countries, no comparison. And when you go into Cambodia and Vietnam and Malaysia and Myanmar and all that stuff, you see dental hospitals. And, there, and, and I did a podcast from, I think it was Cambodia, at the top floor. It was the tallest building in the city. And one floor is oral surgery, pediatric dentistry, all the things like that. And, and that's just, and, and you say, why is it not in America? Well, I got a bigger why for you. How come in New York City, when they invented the phonograph, Thomas Edison, and still movies, 40 years of still movies and a phonograph before one guy said, well, why don't we add the sound to the still movie? It never occurred to anyone. They just watch silent movies. And what's even dumber, which makes me lose almost all faith in humanity, is how long it took them to mix peanut butter with chocolate. I mean, good God, they waited centuries for that. What's wrong with these people? So, so yeah, dental hospitals, I guarantee you, a hundred years from now, Toronto is in, and Montreal and Phoenix is going to have a 20-story building downtown called dental hospital with oral surgeons, oral medicine, oral path. I mean, it's, it's just obvious. It's as obvious as the podcast I'm podcasting from in Cambodia. It's that obvious, but right now Americans are watching still movies with their phonograph in the other room and they haven't mixed their chocolate with their peanut butter yet, but they'll get there. All right. I, uh, maybe you'll start the first dental hospital in NYU. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, they function as a dental hospital now, basically. But it's not in the public's mind. They don't see dental exactly. hospital. Exactly. Yeah. And it's not. It's not. It's not a thing. It might be. It might be a thing in some doctor's mind, but it's not a thing for the people. Yeah, public perception. Uh, thank you for giving your time to us, Doctor Fran, tonight. I have a quick question. Can you comment on the sustainability? and outlook of the lean and mean model versus having a profi palace. Lean and mean, you're referring to Dr. Rick Kirshner of Comfort Dental? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, say the question. You want me to compare the lean and mean Rick Kirshner versus what? Based, the profi- uh, versus having like a, a large profi palace with a, a high overhead, lots of hygienists. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's um, Rick Kirshner is right. I love Rick. He comes off as a mean, tough, abrasive guy, but he's really just an adorable teddy bear. But he's one of my five friends who, if we want to have lunch, he sends his jet out to pick me up. I've only got about five of those guys says, well, I'll just send my jet out and then we'll meet at the, you know, they'll fly you back to the airport and you eat lunch there. But the bottom line is, like I said earlier, um, there's only three publicly traded dental offices in the world. There's two in Australia, one 300 smiles, and they all, and I've podcasted the, the, the founding CEO on Dentistry Uncensored, and they all have the same business model, seven to seven, seven days a week, no hygienist. But again, the no hygienist, it's, it's not profitable, not because the hygienist, it's not profitable but because, uh, like I say, you know, you got to, $20 an hour assistant that can set up the room. Why do you have a $40 an hour hygienist do it? Um, why are you having a $40 an hour hygienist take x-rays when a $20 assistant can do it? And then when the hygienist needs to come in and probe, she needs a $20 assistant. So now I got a $40 hygienist, $20 assistant doing the cleaning for $55. I mean, it's mathematically insane. And then and then when it's all done, she's got to wait 10 minutes to get for the doctor. Then the doctor's run behind, he goes in there and he'll spend three minutes. So nothing, no cells, no communication, no education, nothing gets done. We know the more time you spend with the patient the more i'll get done and on a new patient exam it's about 15 minutes so if the assistant seats up the room gets a patient takes the x-rays you come in to probe and she'll record then she leaves and you're scaling well while you're scaling you're like hey how about those nicks oh my god who do you think's gonna win the super bowl you know um does it bother you that i'm a dentist and i watch hockey where people get their teeth knocked out i mean how completely mentally uh, deranged is that, but you're pressing the flesh, you're earning trust, you're talking because you're selling the invisible. They're not going to buy. They never go to the store and say, you know what? I don't know what's in that box, but it's $400 and I hope it's good. 
They don't buy invisible shit. They buy you. And they're looking at, and they're saying, asking questions that you might not even see they're asking. Like, every time I come in here, he's got a different assistant. I called the other day and I said, yeah, I want to get my teeth clean is, uh, with Lori. Lori? Ha! <laughs> We fired that bitch a year ago. We got a new girl named Amy. And they're like, why does nobody stay here? Why is it a revolving door? The only guy who's always here is this guy. Uh, I think I'm in the wrong place. So you're nice, they're nice, but they're scared because they're buying invisible. Humans are control. They want their own house. They want to live in their own cave. And if you come in that cave, I don't care if you're a T-Rex or a saber-toothed tiger, they're going to try to kill you. Um, they're, they're, they don't know if you're a predator or prey or you're going to be nice to me. Are you going to eat me? So they got to build trust. They don't like that. They would rather go in there and just pay a dollar for bottled water. I buy an iPhone. I'm buying Steve Jobs. Um, Coca-Cola, it's been around 100 years. But I just went to you, and you told me uh, that I uh, need to have a... Uh, that I have diverticulosis and need to have my uh, colon roto rooted. I'm like, Really? You know, I mean, I mean that that's a lot of faith and trust. So if I don't see the same staff, if I if I see any red flags, I don't need much to run because I'm already scared and I don't I, I don't know if I should trust you or not. So you build trust by spending more time with them. Well, you're not spending time with them when you refer out the cleaning. And it's only 15 minutes of an hour. And then when you spend that 15 minutes, every time exam comes, you'll get them to con convince them to do about another $387 with a dentistry. And if you blow in and out of there in three minutes, they don't get any dentistry done. So what are you even trying to do? And um, so, um, yeah, I mean... Success leaves clues. Um, Rick Kirshner, uh, and by the way, Rick Kirshner, um, he doesn't practice dentistry, and he really doesn't own a dental operation. I want to make that very clear. Love him, love, love him, Cindy, um, Paul. I mean, I love the whole family. But the bottom line, it's a real estate deal, just like McDonald's. McDonald's is a hamburger store. Rick Kirshner took that business model right out of Ray Kroc, where what they do is Ray Kroc, you go buy the nicest corner at First Street in Maine, and whatever that cost, um, say it's cost a uh, half a million dollars. Then he put his box on there for four hundred, the guts for three hundred. Whatever he has into it is the franchise fee. So now you come along and he says, "Hey, I'll sell you this uh, franchise, Henry. Uh, it's one point two million." So you give him $1.2 for the McDonald's franchise fees. Now McDonald's owns this land building in free and clear cash, and then they just take 12% off the top. Rick Kirshner, he'll go, and he doesn't even buy new stuff. He always buys used. Like, he'll drive down a four-lane street. He'll drive around Montreal, and he'll find some old 2,000-square-foot law office, accounting office. Sometimes it's a house, and he'll buy that, and if it had a yard, he'll put in a parking lot, and he'll turn it into a dental office. And whatever he bought the house for, say two fifty. dollars Whatever he put into the remodel, another two fifty. Now it's five hundred dollars. So now he sends Henry the franchise for Comfort Dental for five hundred. Now he's free and clear. And then he signs you to a ten year lease. So now every month he has two hundred paid off dental offices that all send him a five thousand dollar a month rent check on the first of the month. That's why he flies a jet and I drive a Lexus. He's a real estate tycoon, and so some dentists. Love dentistry and real estate. Again, one plus one equals three. It's really cool if you can take peanut butter and add chocolate, if you can take a silent film and add the phonograph, if you can take your love of dentistry and add real estate. Um, and the other thing I'd recommend is these... Uh, Oh, my God, on YouTube. You know what I would have done to had YouTube when I was your age? Are you kidding me? We'd have to go to the library. All the books were older than I was. My, I was born in 62. Our encyclopedias at home were made in 52. You can get all these business stories on the Internet, in, in audio books. I read probably three or 400 autobiographies, and those were big books that take a long time to read. Now I would see my sons watch a 15-minute you know, YouTube video on on Ray Kroc, and it, it's better than the damn book I read that took two weeks to read it. You know what I mean? So success leaves clues. Just follow your heart, follow your love. And I, I love business because it's it's a game. It's a it's a tough game because 
you got to predict what humans are going to do. I mean, look at this vaccine. They 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 said, okay, everyone's going to want a vaccine. Who the hell wants to die from COVID? So we're not going to do single shots. We're going to box it in a hundred, and we know a quarter of Americans aren't going to take it because they're uh, anti vax And it's rude to call them anti vaxxers They're just a control group. You need a control group in any scientific experiment. And um, and when the government starts kicking down your door and forcing a vaccine in you, they're gonna they're gonna lose their life. And furthermore, um, it's none of the government's business i mean they 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 just they just they don't know where to draw a line and um that is a line that will cost a lot of people their lives when they so they'll start slowly marginalize them well you can't go to school well you can't fly we're gonna make you a second class citizen until you give up Dude, 200,000 years, they never give up. They fight to death every single time. If you live in a country where half want a hamburger, half want a cheeseburger, make a McDonald's that has hamburgers and cheeseburgers. Why do you always got to say, no, damn it, everyone's eating a cheeseburger. Um, the milk is, you know, just just relax. It's no big deal. Half want a hamburger, half want a cheeseburger. But look at the human mind. They went into game theory. So we knew a quarter weren't going to vax, but the other three quarters were. So we're going to make them, the, and these boxes come in 100. My 82-year-old mother says, you know, Howie, I'm going to wait and see. I mean, I want to see. I want to see what happens when these other people take it. I'm like, Mom, you're 82 years old. You don't have any time to wait and see. But my mom's 82, and she's in game theory. So business is pretty neat because when you say this is a no-brainer, you're right. You don't have a brain. <laughs> because the law of unintended consequences is going to slap your ass back in reality at least 10 times a lifetime where you're going to say, ah, this is a no-brainer. This is exactly how it's going to turn out. Well, if you can predict the future, why do they play the hockey games? I mean, you already know who's going to win. Why waste anyone's time playing the game? The Pittsburgh Steelers were 10-0. and zero. They were a gimme to win the Super Bowl. They lost the first game of the playoffs. Nothing is for granted. Humans, I wish now that, um, I wish they'd change the name of humans to just entropy. It'd make it simpler for physics and math and everything. Just, oh, it's just entropy. Humans are batshit crazy. They're aware of their own existence. What does that mean when they're aware of their existence? All the other animals are locked in the present. They're just looking at food, prey, water. They're always in the present. But for you to be aware of your existence, you have to un hinge from reality and then you can start daydreaming and thinking and your mind can take you anywhere and that affects how they get fix their teeth how they spend their money how they believe in religions and politics and all that things like that so the great thing to be aware of your existence means that exactly at the same time you're detached from reality so it's it, it, i i love business it's it's the craziest kick-ass game I've ever played, and I love playing it. Um, I got two loves. I got dentistry and business. Love them both. We can take one last question. Uh, Dr. Farhan, again, you've been incredibly generous with your time, so... Uh, um, can I ask the last answer. question? Absolutely. Go ahead, uh, Yawen. Um, thanks for giving the talk. I was just wondering what you think about um, investing our line of credit. Investing with other people's money? You, you mean a yes, line of credit? Yes, it's the bank's money. Yeah. So you're but, talking about borrowing other people's money where it's a debt you have to pay it back to go invest? Is that the question? Yes. yes. That is a really bad idea. I cannot tell you how bad of an idea that is. That's a margin call. That's a disaster. Um, yeah, that uh, leverage is a good thing. I mean, uh, you know, two leverage is a wedge. A lever over a wheel is a uh, is a pulley. A lever into a wheel is a wheel and axle. But a lever of other people's money that you have to pay back on an investment that can go south. Um, and by the way, I know you won't show your face. All I can see is Yao Wen Chen, but I bet you're 10 times cuter than you think you are. I know you can't show your face. But I bet it's not nearly as bad as you think it is, Joanne. You should show your face. Ah, there she is. I got her to show her face. How adorable. Yawen, please don't invest with other people's money. That is that is a now if it works, everybody thinks you're a genius. But right now we're in the greater full theory. When you buy Tesla, that's worth more than all the other car companies, your only investment strategy is the greater full theory. Like oh, I'm gonna buy it. And in a month, I'm going to sell it to someone crazier and wilder than I was. But sometimes humans get sober 
and they wake up to reality, and one guy sneaks out and says, I'm going to cash out my poker chip. And the next guy says, so is I. And the next thing you know, everybody's running for the door, and the party's over, and I've lived through that four times. Do not invest with other people's money. And I don't, now, I'm not a government. You know, if you're a government, you, you would say, well, I'm going to take that option away from you because that's what government does. Oh, my God. That is a, are you safe? That dog looks like it could eat you for breakfast. What is it, a map? What is it? He's a half poodle, half Bernese mountain dog, so he's huge. <laughs> yeah, so um, Charlie, did, did I answer your question, or did yeah. you have another question? No, that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And if you uh, if that dog starts to eat you, you're going to need to call someone to come up. No, he's, uh, he's a gentle soul. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you gentle, gentle? Yes. Well, man, I had fun talking to your class. I love the the youth, the enthusiasm, the bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and you guys are the, I mean, that's, that's I, the one thing I love the most about dentistry is I always, as the older I get, the safer I feel about handing the baton to you guys. I think the next generation of dentists, I think they're better than our class. I mean, I really do. I mean, every time I see dental schools, I'm like, God dang, our profession attracts the most kick-ass people I've ever met. I mean, it's just like a, this has been like a house of studs party and uh, smart, intelligent, good looking. I mean, my God, I'm honored that you all are choosing uh, the same profession I did. So thanks for choosing dentistry. And just remember, when you're as old as I am and you have diabetes and erectile dysfunction and... uh I want you to leave dentistry better than you found it. And that's all I can ask for anybody. That's the only meaning of our life is to replace ourselves and leave the playground better than we found it. And talking to this class, I just feel so confident that the next generation of dentists are going to leave it better than they found it. So thank you for that gift. Thank you, uh, Dr. Farron. And and we're all honored that uh, you joined us tonight. So thank you again for for all your insight. And uh, everyone, please give him a big virtual round of applause uh we wish we could be uh, together in person but it's nice that we get to do this across uh across the country so all right guys have a good evening <laughs>